Hello everyone. Today we're going to discuss a clade of adorable, long snout, curly tailed fish. So let's jump right in. Seahorses are members of the genus Hippocampus. If you're wondering why you've probably heard that term before, well, you're using the organ that contains the hippocampus. It's part of your brain, and the organ got that name because an early investigator noticed how much it resembled a seahorse. However, we're not here today to talk about the brain. We're going to talk about fish. Seahorses are very well known among fish for a number of reasons. For starters, they're just so cute. I mean, look at their iconic heads separated from the body by a distinctive neck, their tiny dorsal fins and curly tails. Seahorses spend much of their time anchored by their tails to seagrass, corals, or mangrove plants due to being very weak swimmers. Unlike most fish, they swim vertically and only have two pairs of fins, pectoral fins on either sides of the face, and dorsal fins low on the back. The pectoral fins aren't even really used for swimming, they're used more for steering. Because of this and their unconventional shape and posture among fish, seahorses are very slow swimmers. The slowest swimming fish in the world is a seahorse, the dwarf seahorse, Hippocampus zosterae, which moves 1.5 meters, about 5 feet, per hour. This therefore makes seahorses an easy target for larger predatory fish. Or it would, if you could see them. A logical adaptation to compensate for not being able to swim fast is camouflage, so, of course, seahorses have become masters of disguise. Pygmy seahorses live in close association with octocorals, colonial hydrozoans, bryozoans, seagrass, and algae. The stereotypical seahorse, Hippocampus hippocampus, doesn't look that dissimilar at first glance from seagrass or kelp. You would be forgiven for overlooking them in a local aquarium. That, however, is nothing compared to Hippocampus barjabanti, which looks nearly identical to a piece of the Gorgonian coral, Muricella plectana. Likewise, Hippocampus denisa looks extremely similar to the coral Anella reticulata. Typically, when people think of camouflage relating to seahorses, they visualize the leafy sea dragon Phycodurus equus. But the leafy sea dragon isn't super close to seahorses. Both seahorses and sea dragons are in the family Synathidae, but seahorses are more closely related to pipefish of the genus Synathus, while sea dragons nest together. Confusingly, there is also the ribboned pipefish Haliichthys, which looks like a leafy sea dragon and is sometimes even called the ribboned sea dragon. However, Haliichthys is more closely related to seahorses. We'll get more into the phylogenetics of seahorses and their relatives later. But if you're wondering whether seahorses and sea dragons implies the existence of sea knights, then you'll probably be happy to learn that the answer is, well, yes and no. In medieval Flemish mythology, there were apparently creatures that were half fish, half knight, called sea knights. Additionally, there is a helicopter called the Boeing Vertol CH-46 Sea Knight, the Wikipedia page of which has an entire section dedicated to notable accidents and incidents. Hmm... Regardless, aside from camouflage, seahorses have a second line of defense. Another thing about seahorses that is unlike most bony fish is that they completely lack scales. Instead, their bodies are covered with protective armor consisting of bony plates with skin stretched over. This makes them very rigid in spite of lacking internal ribs. If you were to hold a seahorse in your hands, it would feel more like holding a lobster rather than a flounder. This armor is both strong enough to protect seahorses from predators who kill prey by crushing, such as larger fish, crabs, rays, sea turtles, and birds, and is flexible enough to allow them to grasp plants and coral. The reason is that these plates form articulating rings along the length of the fish. The hardness of the plates is, as one might expect, greatest at the outer surface for protection, but softer at the overlapping joints for mobility. Adaptation works in so many wonderful ways. At the tail region in particular, the rings are formed by four interlocking L-shaped plates, which is why seahorses have rectangular rather than cylindrical tails, as is the case for fish, generally including their close pipefish and pipehorse cousins. 
In 2015, researchers performed an experiment where they tested computer models and 3D printed prototypes mimicking seahorse tails. The researchers found that having armored rectangular tails protected the seahorse's vertebrae better than armored cylindrical ones. Further, when compressed, the plates bend and buckle in such a way that the tail segments and vertebrae are protected from fracture, even at 50% compression of the original length. In essence, prehensile tails are an ancestral character in seahorses, so any armor adaptations would have to accommodate this feature. The first armored tails would probably have been cylindrical, but selection for protecting internal organs and vertebrae would have favored increasingly rectangle-like armor. As said before, the seahorses' camouflage and armor compensate for their lack of mobility due to their particular shape and posture. But you might ask, how is having such a shape beneficial then if it makes them so slow? Well, though they may not look like it, seahorses are actually formidable predators. They mostly eat small crustaceans, such as tiny shrimp or copepods. Even though the crustaceans are fast and evasive, seahorses are still able to catch them. The seahorse hunting strategy is more like that of a chameleon, relying on stealth to ambush their prey. They latch onto anything stationary with their tail and wait until something swims by. Once in striking range, the elastic energy stored in their tendons are released such that the head moves rapidly towards the prey item and the mouth sucks it in without even using the jaws, which are fused into a tube. All this happens in a few microseconds, leaving no time for the prey to react and escape. This is called pivot feeding. It's among the fastest feeding motions that we observe in nature. So while they can't swim fast, their secret is to catch their prey very quickly. Their sit and wait hunting style is another reason for their camouflage. Their prey doesn't notice them until it is too late. The seahorse prey capture success rate is a very high 79% when both successful approach and strike are taken into account and the success rate becomes 94% after their prey is within striking distance. But how does the seahorse shape help them in this regard? Seahorses, as well as their relatives, the pipefish and sea dragons, all use pivot feeding. And while pivot feeding is a successful hunting strategy, it only works within short distances. Thus, they have to carefully approach their prey without alerting them. This is where the seahorse has the edge. A study published in Nature 2011 shows that the biomechanics of their morphology allows seahorses to catch their prey at greater distances compared to their straight-shaped relatives, the pipefish. Another study from 2013 shows that seahorses have a particular head morphology that minimizes the hydrodynamic disturbance that is generated when the seahorse strikes at its prey. Less disturbance means it is harder for the prey to detect the seahorse before it is caught. Seahorses are also famous because the males do something rather unusual among animals. The males hold the offspring while they develop. In a way, the males get pregnant. After a courtship ritual between two mates, which can take three to four days, the female deposits her eggs into the male's brood pouch via her ovipositor. The male then fertilizes the eggs in the brood pouch, ensuring that the offspring are definitely his. Finally, the offspring develop in the brood pouch before the male releases dozens of tiny seahorses into the world. A problem that pregnancy often poses is a potential rejection from the immune system. Seahorses and their relatives exhibit modifications in their adaptive immune system to avoid this issue. Pipefish are missing several genes of the MHC, or major histocompatibility complex, too, and seahorses in particular have a highly divergent invariant chain of MHC2 called CD74. Now, with that in mind, what about the evolution of seahorses? For that, we turn to YouTube's favorite theropod, Dapper Dinosaur. Take it away. Thanks, Jackson. Hello, everyone. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. If you like content related to paleontology and debunking creationism, then check my channel out. It's linked in the description. Now, let's manage some phylogenetics. Seahorses are ray finned fish, meaning they're members of the class Actinopterygii. Further, seahorses are members of the order Synathiformes, which they share with goatfish, sea moths, and dragonets. Finally, we come to the family Synathidae. Both the order and family names refer to the fact that the jaws of pipefish, sea dragons, seahorses, trumpetfish, and cornetfish are fused together. Thus, rather than chomping their food, they vacuum it up. Synathiformes share a common ancestor that lived around 80 million years ago. So while the dinosaurs were still knocking around and marine reptiles dominated the seas, they are divided into two major clades, a benthic clade, containing goatfish, sea moths, and dragonets, and a long-snouted clade, 
containing trumpetfish, pipefish, and seahorses. These clays radiated in the late Cretaceous, but the reason for the radiation is currently unknown. Toothlessness in Synathiformes seems to have resulted from the pseudogenization of proline glutamine rich secretory calcium binding phosphoprotein genes, which are involved in the formation of enamel. Toothlessness in turtles, birds, baleen whales, pangolins, and anteaters also resulted from the pseudogenization of genes in this family. Both Synathiformes and anteaters have adapted to toothlessness by elongating their jaws. The last common ancestor of Cygnathidae lived about 52 million years ago. As mentioned previously, seahorses are iconic for a number of reasons. Reduced fins, male pregnancy, their prehensile tail, and their vertical posture, among others. Fortunately, the evolution of Cygnathids occurred so recently, geologically speaking, that all the major morphological transitions are present in extant members. To put it another way, there are no missing links. We have dawn pipefish with fused jaws, such as Solenostomus, pipefish without brood pouches, such as Nerophis, pipefish with brood pouches, such as Cygnathus, pipefish like pygmy pipe horses, like Amphilicturus, seahorse like pygmy pipe horses, like Idiotropiscus, and of course, true seahorses. So let's go through each of the aforementioned traits. First, Cygnathids have reduced fins compared to other fish. Pelvic fins, which are homologous to tetrapod hind limbs, have been lost in a number of Telios lineages, such as pufferfish, some populations of sticklebacks, eels, and our present subjects. The loss of pelvic fins in Cygnathids appears to be related to the loss of transcription factor TBX4, which is conserved among jawed vertebrates. Experimental evidence shows that the loss of this gene in mice leads to hind limb development failure, and interestingly, but unsurprisingly, knocking out this gene in zebrafish causes them not to develop the pelvic fins. Side note, there is a natural strain of zebrafish called pelvic finless, you can guess why, who have mutations in TBX4. Next, male pregnancy seems to have evolved as a result of the exaptation of astacin metalloprotease genes. These genes exist in animals from cnidarians to mammals, and in 2006, researchers determined that the pipefish Synathus covelli highly expresses the gene subfamily Patristicin, which nests within the astacin metalloprotease gene family in its brood pouch while pregnant. Hippocampus abdominalis males also express this gene subfamily in their brood pouch during pregnancy. There are six patristicin genes in seahorses, but the duplication events that form them long predate male pregnancy in cygnathids, indicating acceptation of genes that were already present in teleosts. Interestingly, a similar gene, called C6AST, which is a member of the same overarching gene family, has undergone repeated duplication in platyfish. Female platyfish are ovoviviparous, meaning that their eggs are internally fertilized, but they do not lay eggs. They instead release live young. So genes related to pestricin and C6AST have undergone repeated duplications in response to similar evolutionary pressures. The morphological evolution of male pregnancy can also be seen in modern synethids. As mentioned previously, there are both extant pipefish with and without brood pouches. There are even extant pipefish who have only partially enclosed brood pouches, such as Corythoichthys. Clearly, half a pouch is still beneficial. Female Neurophis pipefish simply glue their eggs to the male's abdomen, while male Zygnathus pipefish house their embryos in a brood pouch. In 2016, researchers tested the hypothesis that the brood pouch protects embryos against hypoxia, but they found that the embryos of pipefish without brood pouches fared better on average than the embryos of pipefish with brood pouches under hypoxic conditions. It is a fact that pipefish with brood pouches have larger eggs on average than pipefish without. However, whether oxygen accessibility played a major role in synathid evolution is still under investigation. A 2020 paper proposed that ancestrally nest-building territorial synathids could have ensured paternity of their offspring by guarding the young. Some synathids, as well as other fish, do indeed build nests, so this isn't a stretch by any means. Guarding offspring increases their survivability, but this can be increased further by attaching the offspring to the parent, in this case, the male. This would be useful if there were a high predation of the offspring, leading to the birth of increasingly precocial young. Other fish that guard their young, such as sticklebacks, produce offspring that are poor swimmers at birth, but that are also released much earlier in their development. Once the embryos are adhered to the male, several different selective pressures could drive the formation and closure of the brood pouch. For starters, male pipefish without brood pouches are more often preyed upon than male pipefish without, because synathid eggs are brightly colored, being bright orange, yellow, and pink. Housing the eggs in on an increasingly closed brood pouch would increase camouflage abilities. Second, brood size can also increase as a function of pouch size. The reason is that in open pouches, the eggs must be laid on paternal tissue, so making more paternal tissue means more places for eggs to be laid. Finally, let's understand their vertical posture. 
Seahorses swim vertically, while all other synaptids swim horizontally. Seahorses aren't the only fish that swim vertically. Razorfish, which are also members of synathiformes, do it too. Evidently, this is an adaptation where razorfish camouflage themselves as sea urchin spines. But how did seahorses attain this ability? The synathid that is most similar morphologically to Hippocampus is Idiotropiscus, known colloquially as the pygmy pipe horse. Idiotropiscus looks like a seahorse but swims horizontally, implying that the seahorse body plan evolved before vertical swimming. Now, phylogeographic analysis indicates that the synathidae likely originated and largely evolved in Australia. There is, however, one clade of synathids native to the western Atlantic Ocean, possibly crossing open waters by hitching themselves to mats of floating vegetation. About 34 million years ago, sea levels lowered as a result of a climactic cooling event, and about 25 to 20 million years ago, the Australian plate collided with the Eurasian plate. Both of these events open up the vast shallow seas that were prime real estate for seagrasses. From there, Idiotropiscus and other pygmy pipe horses represent a lineage that remained horizontal, being mainly restricted to macroalgal reefs, while Hippocampus used their camouflage game by radiating in the growing seagrass environment and going vertical. And that's the evolution of seahorses, masters of stealth and disguise. These bizarre fish have a host of adaptations that make them stand out among fish. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.